Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for some real estate entertainment. Uh, please be sure to stay the full hour for your one hour continuing legal education credit. If I end up going over an hour, you'll receive credit in 15 minute increments. And feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box and I'll answer them after my presentation. Let's get started. Understanding PAPA. There's been a lot of excitement about the new residential purchase agreement. Unfortunately, nobody has been speaking about PAPA. PAPA has been left behind and PAPA is so important. What is PAPA? It's the probate agreement purchase addendum. Please note, the new residential purchase agreement does not replace the old probate purchase agreement. The probate verbiage was extracted from the PPA into the PAPA, so there's more flexibility to use other purchase agreements based on property, property type when handling probate sales. So there are four purchase agreements. There's the residential purchase agreement, there's a residential income property purchase agreement, the commercial purchase agreement, and the vacant land purchase agreement. So your agent can use any one of these purchase agreements with a PAPA. So if you have a vacant land that's probate or a trust that requires a probate procedure, you use the VLPA with a PAPA, you don't use the RPA. So these are four important agreements that you should get to know. And especially you should really know what's in the PAPA. Now the PAPA was recently updated, so be careful. Some transactions that occurred before February will have an outdated PAPA. So the most recent version was updated February, 2022. Now what changes were made? Let's take a look. This one is, is important. Number four of the PAPA discusses what happens when there's court confirmation, when that's required. Previously to this update, you'll see in the red, these are the changes. Um, they added the word and escrow shall close within 10 days from receipt of such order. So prior to the update, it didn't mention anything about when escrow should close from the time that the certified court order is received. It just mentioned that the, the buyer has 10 days from receipt of the court order to, to pay the balance of the purchase price. So I'm really happy about this change. It provides some clarity. And it states seller shall not be obligated to sign escrow instructions or incur any escrow costs prior to confirmation. Now, why was that added? That was added to protect the seller from a notice to seller to perform since the purchase agreement calls for escrow to be opened a few days after acceptance. And the seller is not obligated to sign escrow instructions prior to court confirmation. Now, I just want to add that if anyone uh, would like uh, to see the PAPA, the latest version, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll get you a sample copy. Not a problem. Now, the second update is regarding buyer's vesting and dispute resolution, another very important um, addition. So the red, again, are the changes. Vesting. Buyer intends to take title as follows. This really um, simplifies the process because prior to this addition, the attorneys, when preparing the petition, always have to reach out to the agent. How are they taking title? What is the vesting? So they need to take that extra step to reach out, go back and forth, get that information. Now with the PAPA, the agent should enforce the buyer's agent to specify what the vesting is in the form. So once by the time you have a fully executed contract, the vesting is clearly stated here. So this is a very good addition. Uh, again, it streamlines the probate process and doesn't require the attorney to request information when preparing the petition. Now, the next addition is important as well, dispute resolution. It discusses liquidated damages, mediation and arbitration clauses, which are deleted from the purchase contracts, not just from the RPA. Remember we have four purchase contracts. So that's being deleted from any of those purchase contracts being used since the probate court has jurisdiction over those matters. Next one is waiver of commission rights. Another very important one. This was never in the contract before. Uh, this discusses in cases where there's a successful overbid in court by a different buyer's broker, the buyer's broker whose, whose offer was accepted subject to court confirmation waives all commission rights. Very, very important. 
There have been some issues in the past about this and this protects everybody, very important. Um, and the next addition on letter B, that addresses probate code 10160.5, indicating that the estate is not liable to pay commission to an agent broker who is the purchaser or has any interest in the purchaser being represented. Again, very, very important. Now, please review the latest CAR purchase agreements and the PAPA. Very important to review the version dated February, 2022. And please let me know if you have any suggestions on how to update the PAPA. I'll relay them to the CAR standard forms committee. Our goal should be to streamline the probate process and reduce the seller's potential liability. It's very important that we take the time to do this because you know, the less, um, the less that the agent has to document in an addendum to address the various probate procedures and probate code, the less liability there is. If we can include all the different scenarios in the PAPA regarding trust and probate and whatever you know, cases come up, you guys are the experts. Let's think of the, of the language to add. Let's think about it. What is missing from the PAPA? Please get back to me. I'll, I'll relay all of that to the uh, Standard Forms Committee. And again, if anybody wants a copy of the PAPA, the latest version, please reach out to me. My email is here on the slide. You can also text me on my cell phone. I'll be happy to send you a sample copy. Um, now, what I did is I requested to add a buyer's mailing address field in the PAPA form to be referenced by the probate attorneys for, for proof of service for the notice of hearing in order to, again, to streamline the process. So they added the vesting field, which is important, but the other thing the attorneys go to the agents for, they always reach out and say, what's the buyer's mailing address? I need to issue a proof of service for the notice of hearing. So again, the agent has to go, go back because the buyer's mailing address is not on the contract and request this information. So why not include that in the PAPA? Let's get all that information up front and we have that ready for the probate attorney. So I already made that request and uh, it should be added on the next version. Let's talk about some pre-marketing. The code, you guys are all familiar with this code. You're all experts. Uh, probate code 10310, letter B, indicates that the court shall examine into the efforts of the personal representative to obtain the highest and best price for the property reasonably attainable. So the whole philosophy behind this probate code is for the personal representative to get the highest and the best price for the property. We need to always keep that in mind. Always keep that in mind. We need to shift our mindset. What is the current probate landscape? You know, I get emails from investors all the time, all the time. And these emails remind me from the time that I worked with the banks. I used to represent Wells Fargo, City Chase. You know, that, that business has slowed down significantly. Uh, and so, you know, they, I, I was one of the largest, um, you know, producers in LA County or actually throughout all of California, representing banks and selling bank owned assets. So, you know, the investors all knew my name and they would reach out to me. Hey, do you have an REO? Do you have an REO? In their mind, REO was a tear down. It was a deal to steal. It was an investor purchase. I see the same thing happening with probate. When they think probate, they think teardown. They think it's a deal. Let's steal the deal. They think this is an investor deal. And so it creates a very bad stigma. And we need to consider the various strategies to achieve goals of the probate code. How do we get the highest and best price? We need to get the right mindset. We need to consider what are the seller's contract terms? What is the property presentation? What does it look like? What does it smell like? Big mistake, stringent seller's contract terms, no contingencies and 10% deposit on probates that don't require court confirmation. If it's not required, if it's not required, let's, let's, not, uh, let's not push that on buyers and make them, you know, scare them off. And poor property presentation that doesn't result in generating the highest and best price. So we're talking about two things here, contract terms and property presentation, two very important aspects to think about. 
So first, let's think about, let's understand the owner-occupant buyer. What type of buyer? We have two different types of buyers out there. We have owner-occupants and we have investors. The owner-occupant is emotional. They listen to their hearts. They do whatever it takes to get the property. Real estate for them is a home where they imagine making happy memories and feeling safe. It's a mistake not to present the property as a home and make it and making it look and smell good. They won't look at comps. They'll offer above and beyond comps. Comps are irrelevant to them. They want the house for their family. First time home buyers, they're nervous. They're nervous about non-contingent offers and large deposits. They don't have real estate purchasing experience. It's a mistake to request non-contingent offers and 10% deposit on probate properties that don't require court confirmation. Now let's talk about the investor buyer. These buyers are rational. Belinda, you have your hand up. Is that a question? Okay. So the investor buyer, these are rational buyers. They make purchasing decisions based on objective criteria, ROI, return on investment. Real estate is an investment that will bring them a profit once construction has been completed. They look at comps and they have a bottom line. The property will be renovated or torn down and rebuilt and the ROI is the driving factor in their decision-making. It's a mistake not to consider value add strategies. Do what makes sense. Now, I do a lot of renovations. I also sell a lot of properties as is. I also do health and safety repairs. I also do the basics. I also do partial renovations. So my strategy is to do what makes sense. I'm not the, the agent that's gonna to come to you and say, let's do, let's do a flip. No, let's ask ourselves what makes sense to again, to uphold the probate code and get the highest and best price. So what are some value add strategies? Let's talk about it. The basics, you just clear it out or do a trash out and do a sales clean. We all know about that. Health and safety repairs. These are important, okay? Because health and safety repair, repairs are inspected, are addressed by an appraiser. The appraiser is really the lender's inspector. He goes out and generates a report. If there are any health and safety reports, repairs to be made, they'll be addressed as subject to repairs in the appraisal. We'll talk about that in detail some more. Partial renovation. You know, this is very, very effective, not spending a lot of money and just doing the basics. Now, your agent, an experienced agent, should have trusted relationships with vendors or those vendors are paid through escrow. And this should be a very easy thing to do, getting somebody to paint the interior and or exterior of the property, depending on the condition, putting a new flooring. You know, if there's, there are stained carpets, can be super cheap to replace those carpets. I have a great flooring vendor that I work with, gives me super low prices, sub, you know, subcontractor prices. And so I pass it on to my clients. Window coverings are so important. How many properties have you seen with ugly curtains still hanging there? And they're in the photos. Take those off, get some low cost blinds. And again, my flooring vendor also does window coverings. So he goes in, does the measurements, and I pass on those savings to my clients. So partial renovation, very important to consider. Converting den to a bedroom. So I actually did this recently. Uh, it was a one bedroom house and the, uh, there was a den. However, you know, it, it, to convert a, a room to a bedroom, that requires a closet. So we discovered that the hall closet backs into the den. So I had the contractor uh, drywall out the door and open it up into the bedroom and we converted the property to a two bedroom property that drove prices up significantly and it was not expensive and again that vendor was paid through escrow so my client did not need to pay anything up front this was a probate sale so again your agents need to think about how can I add value legalizing an ADU there are many instances where there's an unpermitted unit that could easily be legalized to an ADU. Complete renovation. I'm sure everybody is familiar with what that involves. New flooring, new kitchen, new bathrooms, everything brand new from, from head to toe. 
including exterior, that's very important. Not only the interior, it's important to consider the exterior. A lot of times there's stucco damage. And if you're doing a complete renovation on the interior, it's important to take a look at the outside. You want the outside to look as good as the inside, otherwise it'll turn off buyers. So you wanna do, sometimes you have to repair the stucco, do an exterior paint, take care of the landscaping. Think about the big, the whole picture. Professional staging, super important, super important and not expensive. Uh, this is something that I've added to my services. I have several stages that I work with and they, uh, again, they are paid through escrow. And once the, the home is ready for them, we do a, a cleaning that's required before they stage. And they come in and they stage it beautifully. It's, it's really gorgeous. And every property that gets staged, wow, there is so much activity. There's so much excitement. It's so exciting. And the prices go up above fair market value significantly. It really, really does make sense to stage. Mistake, leaving money on the table when these strategies are not utilized. Mistake not to utilize the value at strategies due to lack of funds in the tr trust or estate. Again, work with an agent who has relationships. Then you can add value and adhere to the probate code of getting the highest and best possible price. Again, I wanna, I wanna go back and discuss uh, renovations. Um, and you need to, of course, do the analysis, make sure it makes sense, make sure there are no major repairs needed on the property, consider all repairs and the cost and do the analysis to make sure it makes sense, of course. So you use a strategy that makes sense. Sometimes does it make sense to renovate the entire property? Sometimes you do a partial. Sometimes you just do a, a basic clean out. Okay, mistake, not ensuring properties cleared out and clean. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this, but the photos on the MLS that I'm seeing, agents include photos of trash inside the property, old furniture, boxes, ladders in the garage. I don't understand how that happens. Agents don't remove old ugly curtains or stained carpets and old wallpaper. Agents don't have a sales clean done when the property's dirty and has a foul out odor. Agents should elevate the property's image to draw more interest. Agents should care about the presentation of the property and be reminded of the probate code that requires real estate to be sold at the highest possible price. It's a mistake not to address health and safety issues. This is something that the appraiser looks at. So if you're dealing with a, if, if you've decided to target an owner occupant for, for your, the property, and you should be prepared to do that because like I said, their emotional buyers will offer more than the investor. Always look out for, for health and safety issues. Your agent should look out for that and should address them with you and make the recommendation to make them. What are health and safety issues? Broken, boarded up windows and doors, active plumbing leaks, exposed electrical wiring, uneven flooring, it's a trip hazard, missing smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, unstrapped water heater, Bars on windows preventing proper egress. Garage door that won't open or close. Maybe the roller fell off. Mold. Everybody's scared of the word mold. The M word is scary. But you know what? There's actually no legal requirement in California for testing and remediation. It's not managed by the AQMD like asbestos is. So the AQMD does not get involved in making sure that mold was remediated properly. Well, what is properly? You know, you see mold on a wall. What can be done? You know, the first thing is to check, has it, did it reach the drywall? Has it penetrated through the paint and is the drywall wet? If so, the drywall needs to be removed. Now, any general contractor licensed and insured is fully qualified to handle that. And if it has not penetrated to the drywall, it's a simple cleanup job with bleach. What did the, uh, the mold experts do that's different? The only thing they add are air scrubbers. So if there's mold and you have a general contractor take care of it, you simply disclose it and discuss how it was remediated. Shouldn't be an issue. Mistake, not completing retrofitting repairs. Some agents state that in, state when preparing the application for the city of LA 9A report, they mark that seller has completed the work only to facilitate obtaining the completed report to provide 
to prospective buyers. And seller is not obligated to perform any retrofitting for any city or county under the probate code and the responsibility is that of the buyer. This does not absolve the seller of their responsibility. There is no way that an agent or an escrow officer can waive any laws. These are mandates by the city or county and they cannot be waived. Most transactions require state and most of the time local point of sale retrofit requirements that may require repairs to be made to the property, such as it actually addresses some of the health and safety issues, the smoke detector, the carbon monoxide detector, strapping of the water heater. These are just safety um, guidelines. For example, the state of California requires water heater strapping, smoke detector, carbon monoxide. Note that in probate and trust transactions, smoke detector installation is not legally required. However, it is a lender requirement because it's a health and safety issue and it's prudent risk management to install them. They're not expensive and it makes sense to do it. What if you get squatters in the house and they, uh, you know, there's no heating? What do squatters do to warm up? They light a fire. You want to have those detectors in there. Therefore, it's best practice to have this work completed prior to the appraiser's inspection. Case study, a partial renovation. This is something I worked on. It was an outdated fixer townhouse, and we did minor improvements. There were limited funds in the trust, and we utilized vendors that uh, were paid through escrow. Interior paint costed $4,000. We replaced stained carpet with new carpet for $800. We did a sales clean for 300 and professional staging for $6,000. The results, we generated $100,000 over fair market value. My client was so happy, so happy to be able to achieve this. What's the mistake? Agents should offer basic updating and care about the presentation of the property. Don't forget the probate code. Real estate is to be sold at the highest and best price. Outdated trust property uh, had a complete renovation. This is another case study. Uh, so what happened was I evaluated the comparables. This is a, a scenario where I, I evaluated comps to determine whether it makes sense to do a, a complete renovation rather than a partial. The sold comps indicated the as-is value is 800,000. The sold comps indicated repaired value is 1.2 million. Renovation, carrying, and real estate commission costs total $200,000. The trust invested $200,000 for a $200,000 gain. We spent three to four months renovating for a $200,000 gain to the trust. That's a 30% increase in three to four months. Wow. Here's another mistake. Inappropriate MLS comments. Omit words in the MLS public and private remarks that would indicate property has condition issues. Why is this important? Well, appraisers, most of them, have access to the MLS. And before they go out to a property, they do their research. They'll go onto the MLS and they'll read about the property, the public remarks, the private remarks, so they get a sense of the condition. Now, if I say attention investors, investors dream, these are the types of comments I see that should not be. Uh, placed on the MLS. Fixer, cash offers preferred. Buyer to handle bid for repairs the amount of $10,000. These are just examples. That's going to tell the appraiser where the value is. There are issues. There are issues with this property. You want to use softer, more positive words. Opportunity knocks. Use some TLC to turn it into your dream home. Lots of original details throughout. It's also a mistake not considering the various marketing strategies for occupied properties. Here's a case study. There's a four unit property. It has three occupied and one vacant unit. Which strategy will your agent propose? Number one, add value by adding a tenant in the fourth unit. Number two, add value by adding a fresh coat of paint and new appliances. Add both or sell as is. It's a mistake not to consider and evaluate these options to determine which strategy maximizes the return to the estate or trust. Employing strategy one and two will generate the highest and best offer. It's a mistake not ordering inspections 
on properties requiring court approval. It's good practice for the seller to order general home inspection and termite inspection. Buyers review it, review them during offer negotiations and prior to removal of all contingencies. This creates a level of comfort for buyers and encourages an increased number of offer submissions. Here's another case study. Uh, in a probate sale, the occupant, a beneficiary, discloses to you that there are foundation issues based on what a contractor who visited the property told them in the past. How should your agent respond? Should your agent disclose to all prospective buyers that there are foundation issues and place the property on the MLS? Of course, they're required to disclose it. Or should you order a foundation inspection and bid and disclose these documents and cost to all prospective buyers? The answer is number two. Obtain a foundation inspection and bid and disclose. Otherwise, buyers will exaggerate the cost and use it as an excuse for a deep discount on the purchase price. Not having the cost to cure the issue will further deter owner-occupant buyers due to fear. So if I just state there are foundation issues and I don't know what the cost is, that's going to scare away, first of all, the first-time home buyers. They hear foundation issue, they get scared. Is it 100000 Is it 150000 Is the house going to collapse? What does that mean? Well, foundation repairs can be as... It can cost $5,000, it can cost $6,000, it can cost $2,000. You don't know what the issue is. Just because somebody said there's a foundation issue doesn't mean it's a huge issue. And many, many times I do, I order these foundation inspections through a trusted vendor who also gets paid through escrow, by the way, and it's not a big deal. And then we just disclose it. You don't necessarily have to make those repairs. Disclose it and you'll get first time home buyers. They won't be afraid of the word foundation issue. Mistake, not completing visual inspections. Some agents complete the, it's called the AVID, Agent Visual Inspection Disclosure, and don't document anything. They state they have not been to the property or the property is not accessible since it's occupied. Unless it's in a gated community, there's always exterior access and the agent should visit the property to inspect the exterior and document their findings. It's the law on residential one to four units for the agent representing the buyer and seller to conduct a reasonably competent and diligent visual inspection of the accessible areas. So it's not only the listing agent, I wanna, I wanna clarify, that has to complete the AVID, it's the buyer's agent as well. Both of them have a legal obligation to do so. The agent must disclose to the prospective buyers material facts and defects that should have been discovered during the inspection. Mistake, not maintaining properties since sold as is. There's a big misunderstanding out there when the people say it's being sold as is. As is in their mind means I don't need to do anything. Well, let's read what the CR purchase agreements say about as is. There's actually as is language embedded in them and they actually don't need to be repeated. So paragraph 7B1I of the CAR RPA indicate, indicates the property shall be delivered as is in its present physical condition as of the date of acceptance. The property, including pool, spa, landscaping, and grounds, must be maintained so it's in the same condition as of the date of acceptance. So don't forget, you need to look at all the other, you know, the, the exterior of the property, the pool, the spa, the landscaping, the grounds, and maintain them so that they, they are in the same condition as when an offer is accepted. Let's talk about cash for keys and eviction. It's a mistake not considering cash for keys for occupied properties. Here's a case study. Single family home that's occupied. Which strategy will your agent propose? Attempt to get the property vacant by offering cash for keys to occupant or sell as is? It's a mistake not to consider and evaluate these options to determine which strategy maximizes the return to the estate or trust. Getting the property vacant will draw owner-occupant buyers who will offer a higher purchase price than investors. Like we said earlier, they are emotional buyers. The investors are interested in occupied properties at a substantial discount given they need to invest in an eviction proceeding. I'll share with you a, uh, a story, a successful cash for keys that I transacted um, there was a single family home in Torrance that I was selling. The property was occupied. 
I reached out to the occupant. He was a single dad in financial distress. We established a rapport. I listened to his story. And I told him the, the seller is willing to give you $5,000 if you're living, willing to leave in 45 days. $5,000 was a lot of money for him. He was going through a difficult time. He said, sure, that sounds great. I told him, okay, here are the rules. Condition of the property needs to be the same, no damage. The property needs to be in broom swept condition. Once you do that, I'll come and visit, do a walkthrough and hand you the check. That property had, the garage was filled from bottom to top. He had old cars in the driveway. Uh, it was a mess. There were, there were, it, the, the trash out cost would have far exceeded the $5,000. So this was a great deal. And what I did throughout the 45 days, I put the property in the market. I got owner occupant buyers. I stayed in communication with the occupant, making sure he's making progress. He went ahead to protect himself. He documented the condition of the property, sent me photos. I documented everything for him. He was he was worried about not getting the full $5,000, didn't want to be blamed for the condition of the property. Um, so it was great. You know, when 45 days were up, I came to the property. I did a walkthrough. It was beautiful. He was actually using a broom to sweep the floors. He took me literally broom swept. He was sweeping the, he was using a broom to sweep the floors and he was so happy to get his $5,000 check. He handed over the keys. In a week, we closed escrow to owner occupants at a great price. So it's really important to consider this. And at the same time, while your agent is attempting a cash for keys, it's a mistake not to initiate an eviction proceeding, even while the agent is attempting the cash for keys. Why? Because it doesn't always work out. Sometimes the occupant has a mental illness and it's impossible. I've had that case as well. There was a caretaker who told me she's going to leave. I show up, she couldn't get her act together. There, nothing would get her out except for an eviction. So it's very important to start the process as early as possible to get the clock ticking in case the cash for keys is not successful, unless it's in, in case it's a difficult occupant so that you have that as a backup to proceed with the eviction. Valuation of real estate. Pricing strategy to generate tons of offers. The goal is to generate tons of offers to gain leverage for negotiations. Having one offer on the table doesn't allow your agent to negotiate and drive prices up. Pricing is simply a tool to generate tons of interest, which results in tons of offers. The market ultimately defines itself. Price low. This will trigger lots of eyes looking at the property. The greater number of eyes, the greater number of offers. If the property was not priced low enough and generated an offer under the listing price, lower the listing price to the amount of the offer to generate tons of offers and create a multiple offer situation. Here's an example. And this is a, a, a true situation that I uh, handle. Um, the property was overpriced at a million dollars, which should have been listed for $800,000. Offers come in at 800,000. Should you accept the offer? 200,000 under, there's only one offer. There's a tendency for the seller to say, well, there are no other offers, let's accept it. What else are we gonna do? No let's reduce the listing price to 800,000. That'll generate more interest, more eyes, we'll get multiple offers, more excitement, and I'll push them up as high as possible. With one offer, we don't have the leverage. As the agent representing the seller, I don't have leverage to negotiate when I have one offer on the table. Mistake, pricing a property too high. That limits the ability for the seller to negotiate from a position of strength. Sometimes there's no choice due to pressure from beneficiaries. A good agent needs to explain to the beneficiaries the advantages and disadvantages of listing high. The advantages are none. The disadvantages are many. You'll get limited foot traffic, showings, and att attendees at open houses. Most likely, a small number of offers. This has been my experience. You get five or less offers, and at asking price are a bit over. There's limited ability to negotiate from a position of strength. If the offer is over asking, there's risk in reducing the price as the buyer can file a claim for false advertising. So once you have uh, the property overpriced and you're getting offers that you're not happy with that are above, above the asking price, but you wanted to get much higher, at that stage, reducing the price opens you up for liability.
the buyer can file a claim for false, ad false advertising. There's no such thing as pricing a listing too low. As long as it, go as it goes on the MLS, it's not sold off market, then it gets propagated everywhere on the internet. It's on Zillow, it's on Redfin, it's all over. So every agent and every buyer gets to see it. Research shows that 96% of buyers are shopping for homes online. The bottom line is the lower the price, the more people will see it in their price range when searching online and get excited about finding the deal of the century. I like to create hype. I like open houses with tens of buyers and agents in attendance at the same time. I like showing scheduled back to back so people coming in see the buyers before and after them. Because when people know that other people want something, they want it too. All of this puts pressure on buyers and agents to offer as much as they possibly can. When buyers ask what it takes, we tell them, submit as much as you possibly can so you don't regret it if you lose the property. Pricing a property at the lower end of the comps creates more work for the agent, but benefits the seller. It, it requires for the agent to coordinate more showings. On some of my listings, we get 100 to 200 showings. There are more offers to process. Imagine having 20, 40, 80 offers on a property. Each contract needs to be reviewed, recorded, the file stored. More offers creates more competition. As an agent, I can be aggressive and ask for more and more. Marketing real estate. It's a mistake not to provide effective marketing. Here are some examples of what not to do, and some people do it. There's only one photo of the exterior on the MLS. People take a phone, people take their phone and agents take their phone and take one photo of the exterior and upload it to the MLS. No professional photos. Again, they're taking, taking photos using their phone or their camera. No professional 3D tour. Very, very important. This technology is available and it should be used. No professional marketing video, also super important. The descriptions, many of the descriptions I see are one to two sentences. They're very brief property descriptions. They don't highlight the property using all caps. This is what I really don't like. You see a lot of descriptions with all caps. It creates intimidation, it creates an intimidating impression. It doesn't put the property in the best light. Mistake, stating property will not qualify for financing in the MLS. Some agents market the property as not qualifying for financing when in fact, they could be financed. This type of marketing will detract owner occupant buyers and target the investors, which does not result in the highest and best offer. Properties with health and safety issues, which we discussed, do not qualify for financing since those repairs are lender requirements. They must be made prior to closing. Examples of visible health and safety issues. Again, we discussed it before mold, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, and water heater strapped. If you have your agent assess if there are health and safety issues and obtain a bid to determine if the cost is feasible. It's a mistake to state cash offers are preferred on the MLS. Some agents make the mistake of adding this comment to the MLS. Ask yourself, why does your agent prefer cash offers? The property can require cash, hard money loans due to property conditions such as health and safety issues or not. There's nothing in the middle, and the word preferred does not make sense in the context and should not be applied. Agents using this term are implying the condition is for investors and not for owner users due to inferior conditions. Investors do not bring the highest and best offer most of the time. Many investors reach out to listing agents and offer to be represented so the listing agent can double end the deal. The agents make more money on their commissions but the estate or trust does not get the opportunity to reap the highest and best offer, which is contrary to probate code. Alert, not exposing the property to the market for a sufficient amount of time. If your agent has a buyer as soon as the property is listed on the MLS or shortly after, and encourages you to negotiate and accept, there's a possibility that they're not acting in your best interest and may be working in the interest of the buyer and or their own interests. If your agent insists on accepting another agent's offer without waiting sufficient time for other offers to come in, they might have a backdoor deal between them. Insist that your agent keep the listing active on the MLS for at least 10 days and presents you with all offers that come in during the period before you review and accept an offer. Offer management. Mistake not cross-qualifying 
top prospective buyers with a trusted lender. Now you put the property on the market, you have offers coming in. Let's say you have 30 offers and they're getting financing. How do you know which one is solid? As an agent, the only thing you can see are two things. You can ask for a pre-approval letter and you can ask for proof of funds. That pre-approval letter can be written by anyone, by the buyer's niece, by the buyer's grandma, by the buyer's brother or sister. You don't know who they are. It can be biased with no proof of that assets, income, credit report, nor employment were verified. It's not sufficient. Your agent should establish a relationship with a trusted lender who's willing to cross-qualify buyers. Here's what your trusted, the trusted lender does. The trusted lender will reach out to the buyer's agent and say, I need the following. I need the loan application. I need the DULP findings. DULP is desktop underwriter, loan prospector. These are automated underwriting systems used by lenders. Uh, source of down payment I need. How, where are you coming up with your money? I need to see the credit report. I need to validate employment of the borrower. And the way they do that, the lenders, is there is a, a system that connects to the loan application uh, that the lender runs and it actually verifies employment. It actually tells them that this buyer or borrower in the lender world is in fact employed in this company and reports on wages. It's actually extremely useful, very, very useful. So it's super, super important to have this relationship, for your agent to have this relationship and trusted lenders could identify if any liabilities on the credit report were omitted from the loan application. How do we know that the, the lender, the, the mortgage broker, didn't omit information from the loan application? Only your trusted lender can report that to you. An agent, a real estate agent, has no way of knowing this information. This prevents escrow fallouts and provides your agents with detailed qualification information that real estate agents don't have access to. Super, super important. Mistake, requiring 10% 10 per, 10 deposit, no contingencies on full authority probates. Enforcing these requirements when they're not required detracts owner occupants and prevents the seller from obtaining the highest and best offer. It rules out most of the owner occupant buyers, especially the first time home buyers. Agents should be more accommodating to these buyers and provide flexibility in allowing the buyers to have contingencies to be able to generate the highest and best offer. Now, I'm not saying allow them the uh, 17 days for a loan, 17 days for inspection. No, we can shorten those. We can still be stringent and strict with these buyers, but not to an extreme. If you were a first time home buyer, would you feel comfortable purchasing a non contingent, pur purchasing a, a property with non contingent terms? No, the answer is no. There's probably a, a minority who would but majority would not. And so you can be, you know, you can provide some flexibility. You can say seven day inspection period. Uh, you can say 12 day uh, loan contingency and wait out that time. At the same time, you have your, the agent has their trusted lender cross qualified to make sure that they're solid so that you're not exposing your client to, to some risk and liability. Mistake. Not showing some flexibility when negotiating terms with owner occupants. If court confirmation is not required, need to show flexibility, take a softer approach with owner occupant buyers. Otherwise, many of them will withdraw their offers. First time home buyers will not be comfortable with a high deposit, 10% or no contingencies. Allow for any lender required repairs to be made, paid by buyer using seller's approved vendor. This is very important to include in the terms of the contract for the, um, to allow because you know what if the the health and safety issues that your agent uh, considers what if they're not comprehensive and what if they miss something so you do want to allow them to make those lender required repairs but you want to also limit the liability by stating using sellers approved vendors make sure they're licensed they're insured there are no issues and of course the buyer will pay for it mistake not waiving termite inspection your agent should make sure that the contract includes a term indicating that buyer is waiving termite inspection. Why? Because if the contract includes a request for a buyer or seller to pay for a termite inspection, the lender will request a copy for review. And the lender guidelines require for section one termite clearance 
and would therefore become a condition of the loan. And those repairs would have to be completed prior to closing. So if the purchase contractor states seller to pay for termite inspection or buyer pays for termite inspection, the lender will require for termite to repairs to be made during escrow. And so your agent can include a term stating that the termite is being waived. Very important. You know, and termite repairs can include minor things like replacement, replacing pieces of wood, or it could be tenting. Mistake, selecting cash offers over financed offers. Your agent may tell you that it's less likely to fall out of escrow since there's no loan contingency, which at first glance looks like a great reason to agree to a lower cash deal and bypass a higher finance deal. However, if the buyer has been cross-qualified by the listing agent's trusted lender, the buyer has been properly vetted and may be just as strong as a cash offer. Sometimes due to property condition, selling to investor is the only option. However, on many occasions, it's not. And selling to an occupant is the best way to maximize the return for your client. Mistake, not negotiating aggressively. A multiple offer situation provides an opportunity to use the seller's multiple counter offer form to negotiate with multiple buyers and push offers up as high as possible. So the sellers, what is a seller multiple counter offer form? It's a form that indicates that once the buyer accepts it, there's no, there is no final acceptance. Seller needs to respond with a final acceptance. So you as a seller have the chance to go back and counter once again, even after they, they, they accept your seller multiple counter offer. It allows you to go back and forth to multiple people and give them all the same deadline and create a level playing field. It allows your agent to keep raising the bar on the purchase price to see how high buyers will go. Announcing to all buyers that there's a multiple offer situation creates pressure and a greater desire among the interested buyers. Once the top offer is identified, speak with a lender. Does the buyer qualify for a waiver of the appraisal? It's all dependent upon buyer, the buyer's LTV loan to value, credit scores, and DTI or debt to income ratios. So this is a super important step. Um, I've actually done this many times. Um, we actually had a court confirmation and uh, an owner occupant that removed all contingencies, of course, and percent deposit. And he was very well qualified. So I called the, their lender and I said, can we waive the appraisal? And based on the buyer's qualifications, we were able to do that. That's a very important step to take. Mistake, not setting proper expectations with buyers. Prior to opening escrow, your agent should request a call with the buyer's agent and the buyer. This is very, very important. Inform the buyer that offers highest. However, there are many more and they're all very close. And if any requests are made during escrow, then seller will move on to the next offer. Having tons of offers helps to maintain a position of strength. It works 99% of the time to ensure a smooth escrow with no requests or for, for price reductions or credits. Again, this is super important. It's a, it's a phone call that your agent should make. Once you've, they've identified the highest offer before you open escrow, tell the buyer's agent, I need to schedule. The next step is I need to schedule a call with you and the buyer. You set that up and you, you inform them of the seller's expectations before we open escrow to prevent any games being played. Escrow. It's a mistake not having an effective relationship with the appraiser. So the appraiser calls the listing agent to schedule the appointment for their visit. And what's an appraiser? The appraiser is really the lender's inspector. It's ordered by the lender and uh, they communicate with each other. The lender goes out to the property and reports their findings. The appraiser reports on any health and safety issues, which in turn are reported as subject to repairs on the appraisal report. These repairs must be made during escrow as we discussed and the appraiser is required to return to the property to reinspect and ensure the repairs are completed. Your agent should be proactive and establish a relationship and provide details on any repairs or renovations made to the property as well as comparables justifying its value. 
So when that appraiser calls the listing agent to request access, that listing agent needs to establish a rapport. They need to discuss the property, what type of repairs were made, what type of improvements are made, provide them with a list, have the agent create a, a document that discusses these are the updates that were made, send that to the appraiser, provide comps to the appraiser. The, the appraisers are very open to this information. They actually appreciate it. This is a very important step. Mistake, not keeping the purchase contract void of reference to property condition or repairs. So if the seller does decide to offer price reduction or credit, make sure your agent uses the right form. Most of the time, buyer's agents, listing agents, they're not aware of all the forms. And so the most commonly used is CAR form RR, request for repairs or other action. That's what it's called, the RR form. Well, the RR form requires that you list, you know, the, the uh, inspection reports that were obtained. It's a red flag for a lender, letting them know there's something wrong with the property. Otherwise, why are they requesting for repairs? Instead of that form, make sure your agent is using form A, EA, Amendment of Existing Agreement Terms. Like I said, Form RR is a red flag to lenders. It's an indication that there's something wrong with the condition of the property, and it requires the agent to list inspection reports being referenced. The minute the lender sees that, they're going to say, let me see this inspection report. Uh-oh, the, the appraiser didn't notice you know, these health and safety issues. This is a major issue. They'll pick up the phone, they'll call the appraiser, he'll be out there, he'll re-inspect it, now we have more issues. So that's a red flag, very important to keep that in mind. The form AEA, all it is is a free form field to specify price reduction, credit for non-recurring closing costs, or any other term without the need to discuss why a reduction or credit is being granted. There's no word repairs, There's, it doesn't reference the condition of the property. Include a verbiage requiring buyer to either remove the inspection contingency or all contingencies. Now, one thing that the form RR does have that AEA does not have is it allows you to enforce the buyer to remove all contingencies once you, the seller, has agreed to a price reduction or the credit. So what you do is you use the AEA form and you just include the verbiage that requires them to remove the inspection contingency or all contingencies. You can say seller agrees to this and buyer agrees to remove all contingencies attached as a CR form indicating that any and all buyer contingencies are hereby being removed. A form RR has already been provided, include verbiage to withdraw the RR form. So let's say a buyer's agent does use the RR form and the listing agent wants to use form AEA, they do need to include verbiage that form RR is being withdrawn. Mistake, not enforcing contractual compliance during escrow. So there's a form, CR form called NTB. Notice to buyer to perform. Okay, there's also notice to seller to perform, which I touched on earlier, uh, but uh, notice to buyer to perform is what the, the listing agent want, needs to use during the escrow process. And the first, the first opportunity to use it is the buyer's delivery of the earnest money deposit. So what happens sometimes uh, is that there's a non-contingent offer and everybody's very excited and we open escrow. Their deposit is due within one business day as per contract. We wait and wait, the deposit doesn't arrive. And we're all waiting and there are all kinds of excuses from the buyer. Oh, we're in, uh, we're, you know, we're out of town, we're on vacation, sorry, we can't get to it. And everybody can just wait and wait and no matter what email the listing agent sends, it won't get the job done. The buyers will do whatever they wanna do. So in order to enforce them to perform, you need, your agent needs to use the notice to buyer to perform. And that can actually be used before, it's before uh, the time period is, before the earnest money deposit is due. So to take an aggressive strategy and to ensure the buyer is performing on time, issue the NTB, two days before the action is due by the buyer. So if the removal is due on a Monday, issued on a Saturday, doesn't matter what time, the next day, Sunday is counted as day one, Monday is day two, and the seller can cancel on Tuesday if not removed by Monday at midnight. So without using the notice to buyer to perform, you can't just cancel on a buyer. 
you have to give them an opportunity to perform. You need to give them two days. And so this notice to buyer to perform tells them you have two days to perform or we're canceling. It's super important. And again, to be aggressive, you can issue it beforehand to make sure they deliver on time. The other uh, opportunity to use it is for the removal of contingencies. Your agent should be calendaring the due dates for the contingencies, if there are contingencies, and should be proactive and issue it two days before to make sure the buyers perform. And they take, they take the transaction seriously. They don't think they can just delay it and not perform it. And you know, it, it puts them in a position of power if the listing agent is not enforcing the contract. I have an offer for you for attorneys and private professional fiduciaries, trust officers. I'm happy to provide you and your team with training. You'll receive a complimentary copy of my book titled The Practitioner's Handbook for Probate Real Estate during our training session. And I hope to have the opportunity to work with each and one of you soon. Thank you all for taking the time to be here with me today. And let me take a look at the Q&A now. Okay. Was the probate listing addendum an advisory? PLA did at 1215 also amended. What about the probate advisory did at 1221? That's a question from uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, I don't have that information on the top of my head, but I will definitely um, get back to you on that. Uh, do you still suggest to cross qualify if they are cash offers? No, I don't. If they're cash offers, they're cash, and your agent should be able to uh, look at bank statements. Now, what I do enforce, and I've learned this by working for the banks, this, this was their requirement, that there needs to be either um, a bank letter uh, signed by a bank officer indicating the amount or complete current proof of funds. So you want to look at, at account statements. You want to make sure that all the pages are there. You want to make sure that the buyer's names on the account statements, it's their account. And you want to make sure it's current. It's dated in the past 30 days. How can we receive a copy of the recorded webinars? You can go back and see it. Uh, the Beverly Hills Bar is going to email it to, actually, I don't know, they're going to email it to everybody who was not able to attend. However, I am uh, happy to email it to you, Andrew. I'll do that. I'll make note of that. Andrew, do me a favor. Um, email me, send me an email, and I'll respond with the link. Do you also have experience in bankruptcy sales? Yes, I do, Nancy. I do. We can discuss that. Uh, let's see. Any other questions I uh, didn't answer? I will respond via email. Uh, we're exactly at uh, 131, so good timing. I hope you guys enjoyed it and hope to be able to do this again. And uh, feel free to reach out again. There is, uh, hi, Don, thank you for your kind comment. Um, you know, again, anybody who's interested in reviewing any CR forms, like I stated earlier, I'm happy to provide you with a sample copy so you can review it. Let's, let's improve the, you know, the probate process. Let's reduce seller's liabilities. Please provide me with your feedback, how you'd like the PAPA or other forms updated. I'm happy to pass along that information and work with you and brainstorm. Thank you so much and hope to see you all in person soon. Take care, everybody.